Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. I appreciate all of the time that you give me. I have a really good, really great guest today. With me is Barbara Becker. She has a book called Heartwood, The Art of Living with the End in Mind. And generally, when I have guests and I learn new things, I don't have anybody to apply them on. But the last six and a half years of my life have been a little tough, and I'm tired of it. So I am excited to learn some good stuff I could put to use. So thank you for joining me, Barbara. It is such a pleasure to be with you, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start off with you could give us your history and how you came to write this book, which I wish I had finished. But like I said, life challenges have gotten in the way. (laughs) I'm happy to. So my book is called Heartwood, The Art of Living with the End in Mind. And I started writing it when my earliest childhood friend was diagnosed with terminal cancer and she was only 30 years old. And um, it was really rough going. But as time went on and she was given one year left to live when the doctor said, we can't do anything more for you. She and her name was Marissa. She lived life in the richest, most incredible way. I mean, she had dropped her future story. So all she had was the present. I mean, she knew she wasn't going to live long. And she went ahead and she married her college sweetheart. And she um, spent a lot of quality time with family and friends and her cats. And, you know, in between chemo sessions, she had gone to Italy, which was her family's um, ancestral homeland. And You know, as beautifully as Marissa was living, I was a wreck. You know, I would find myself up in the middle of the night, just full of anxiety about losing Marissa, about my own mortality, about losing my parents someday. Because at that point, you know, my dad had started exhibiting signs of Alzheimer's disease And um, I knew that the end wouldn't be long for them. And um, I really was like, what do we do? I mean, Marissa will die. And what do we do as living? Like, how do how do we respond to loss and tragedy in our lives? So I started reading every last book on end of life that I could from the library And I discovered that wise people throughout time have advised us that if we want to live truly fully, what we should do is not deny the fact that we're going to die, but live with the end in mind. You know, so you see this in um, some of the Christian and um, Jewish uh, wisdom holders. You see it in the words of the Buddha. You see it in our American philosopher, Henry David Thoreau, and the Greek philosophers like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca. It's all over the place. You know, even Steve Jobs from Apple, he was dying quite young. And he said, you know, death is uh, the best invention of life, he said, because it is life's change agent. It really has a way of reprioritizing your life when we turn around and we face it. I have a recent past guest. I've had two. They worked together. One is an end-of-life doula. And she said that when you you embrace the idea that we're all going to die, it makes it easier to accept and to live more fully. So she's, she's echoing what you just said. So it's... It's interesting. Like I love it when I keep getting the same messages in this. Yes. In many- <laughs> it's counterintuitive, isn't it? So like you would think that would make you incredibly depressed. But there have been studies, for example, like walking by graveyards tends to um, initially shock people, but then it sort of puts them in a place of, what am I doing with my life? You know, am I spending time the way I want to be spending time? And it's, um, you know, it's subtle. And the the social psychologists say it's a very positive thing to do. Now, we live in a society 
that emphasizes positivity at all turns. You know, it's better to be young than to be old. And, you know, if we find ourselves sick um, or not doing very well psychologically, that's, you know, terrible. And it, to some degree, you don't want to go to the depths of, of where, you know, our bodies and our minds can take us. But we also don't need to, like, reach for the pain medication every single time we have like a small headache, what would it be like they advise to just hold off a little bit and to see, you know, are, am I really stuck in this pain? Can, can it move? Does it move? Does it have, you know, little gaps where I can breathe again? That makes sense. I got a twitchy eyelid here. <laughs> um, <laughs> My, I think one of my biggest challenges is because my paternal grandmother lived um, pretty fully until she was 103. I tell people I've got 47 more years to go, which is a long time <laughs> considering <laughs> I'm 56. So, you know, it's like I've had a lot of life already and um, I don't, I don't, I, I look at the end in like many more decades, not, not that it could be, you know, 20 years from now, like my parents, both my parents died at 77. So that gives me what, 21 years. That's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather take 47. So I'm wondering if I, if I need a little shift, like, yeah, I'm planning on 47, but what if, yes. what if it's only 21? What if it's only two? Ew, I don't like that thought. Um, too many things still left to do, but I'm working on doing them. So it's yes, it's very smart to do. I've encountered a lot of readers of Heartwood who are forming end of life groups. Um, and they're asking each other, okay, in the next six months, you know, what if this were our last? And every month they come together and they discuss, what would I do? What's on my bucket list? What's on my deeper bucket list, you know, how do I have to make amends? Do I have to say I'm sorry? Like, are there um, work or career projects that you have wanted to fulfill? So um, I'm seeing some of the most alive conversations in these conversations around death. You know, I mean, I know that um, death is viewed as a great taboo in our society, but what's been so interesting to me is that once you open up the conversation around loss and you express your vulnerability and the things that have made you sad or that you might be afraid of, it invites other people in and story kind of begets story. And I find that people just keep on talking. That makes sense. So how should somebody shit? Well, let me back up one step. I've noticed a, a, it's changing this whole, you know, dying as being treated as some sort of failure as if we had a different choice um, is it's changing you know, the mental, the mental health of this country, I don't think is very good, but we're talking about it more, you know, like before saying that might have infuriated somebody, but now it's like, yeah, yeah you might be right. We, we, we might be able to have a, an amicable debate on that one, but I think I'd win. <laughs> but it's, you know, I, I do see a shift that we're, we're becoming more accepting that, you know, death is a part of life and we should just we should embrace it so that we can live more fully, which is what we're talking about today. So I was going to ask, how should somebody start shifting their mindset? Because I think we just completed a bucket list item. And I think I just need to add a lot of stuff to my bucket list because I either don't have enough or my focus is in the wrong place. But, you know, as we talked before, um, before we hit record, so this is February, what is today? The 5th? 6th? Yes, the 6th. I'm looking at the calendar at the bottom mm -hmm. of the screen. <laughs> and unfortunately, my youngest dog is terminal. So he's living in my house, basically on hospice, but acting normal, which is very frustrating. And we're just letting him do all the things that he wants to do. Like he's a runner. So if he can get out front, normally he would be racing down the street like, the devils were chasing him because that's just what he does, but he's not healthy enough for that right now. So 
we can let him out front and he can trot around and be more the way he wants to be. And then when I veer into, dude, you were supposed to go paddleboarding with your dad, Zilla. That's what we call my husband this summer. And you're going to miss out. And then part of me was like, I wonder if we could like get him out on the paddleboard before. I don't know. It's a little cold for that. So it's like, I'm trying to work through shifting my mindset by dealing with this dog. That's not very old and his terminal illness, which came as a surprise. It's not fun. Um, I apologize to the dog lovers that are listening. I know that's sad, but we've given him the most fantastic life. We got him at seven months. He was a rescue. He's a golden retriever and he only weighed 35 pounds. He probably should have weighed closer to 70 and he was anemic. So he was malnourished and now he's living on meatloaf and chicken (laughs) or tisserie chicken. (laughs) So, you know, I don't know if he knows that he's dying, but he's living a good life and that's what I want to do. It's like, I want to be okay with what seems to be a constant uphill struggle. I like, I didn't think I was going to get into my fifties and be like, every year is hard. I don't Mm -hmm. remember feeling that way in my forties and I would like to not feel this way anymore. (laughs) So how can we shift our mindset? Yeah. You know, you find yourself in the role of a caregiver again, and that is really challenging. I mean, it's, it's challenging with our pets too. Absolutely. I mean, this is your beloved animal companion. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you have to deal with that. And, um, I also hear you saying, and it's something like that. I know that you've, you've really taken in through all of your caregiving years, which is that you're not there to fix anything. You know, you sort of see where it's going and you're going to live like in the present with whatever it is that your dog can do, whether that's on the paddleboard or, or, you know, in a cozy little corner of your home. Um, one of the things I did after my friend Marissa died is I decided to go and become trained, um, as a hospice volunteer. And I live in New York City, and there are actually two Zen monks in our town who train people to be with the dying mindfully. Um, they, They are absolutely incredible. And I remember having so much anxiety over what the right thing was to do. What do you do when you go into a room? And, you know, what do you have to know? And what if the patient has all these questions about, like, you know, why are we here and why am I dying? And all those existential questions that I was afraid to be asked. And they kind of said to me, whoa, Barbara, like, calm down, take it slow. And that, you know, one thing I'll never forget that they advised, which was that, you know, if you walk into the room of a patient who is dying and they are sitting in their chair watching Jeopardy, your job is to just pull up a chair and watch Jeopardy with them. You know, like we think that it's so much more than it is or that we have to fix something. And really, it's about meeting people exactly where they are. But, you know, you're asking about this whole paradigm shift of of thinking about dying. And, um, uh, you know, there's a whole movement called the death positivity movement or the death acceptance movement. Um, and we are kind of all at the forefront of this. And it's a really exciting time because of that willingness that we're finding for people to talk about death, not just in big hypothetical terms, but about their own lives and their own questions and the questions about loved ones. So one of the things that I love are the death cafes. Um, Death cafes began in England. They're now being held in 81 countries around the world. Um, And just strangers gathered together to have tea and cake. It's very English still. Um, Right up my alley, tea and cake. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I'm right there with you. And people can, you know, there's no agenda. So people can bring up whatever they want to bring up. You know, they can, they can say, you know, I'm kind of worried about what happens after I die. And, 
you know, what, what does that look like? And what do you all believe? And the conversations are incredibly rich. There are also death over dinners and like many modifications on this theme, but this openness and this willingness, I think is a big part of the death acceptance movement. I actually did an episode. I can't, I think it was in 2020. It's somewhat recent, not that far back, but, um, on what is death positivity is actually the title. And that's, I remember we talked about the death cafes and since I'm not that far from our state capital, I might check into that just because I like to learn new things. And that sounds like an interesting way to, I don't know, at least try it once. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please report back on that. I would love to hear your experience. Now, I'm pretty sure thing... my town doesn't have one of those cause we're kind of rural and kind of small. <laughs> and I would think that Although I could be very wrong, but I would think that the general philosophy and the demographic here would, they're probably following that trend of death acceptance a little slower than some of the rest of us, but I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, um, I also think that it's really important for people when they're starting to talk about death and how it might change their lives to realize that we don't have to take on the biggest losses of our lives first. No, we don't have to review the pain of somebody who we've recently lost if we don't want to go there. Um, you know, we can actually start thinking about loss in, in the many ways it shows up in our lives. Um, you know, we've, during COVID, the non-human losses have been unbelievable. So many people have been moving from their homes. Um, people lost their jobs, uh, their livelihood. Um, you know, I've talked to people who have said to me, you know, this book Heartwood is about physical death, but it's making me think a lot about my divorce or my separation. Um, other people have said, no, when I was a kid, I lost my favorite toy train. And it seems silly, but it meant the world to me and it was gone. And so I find that talking about loss and stepping back and talking about the things that seem smaller can sometimes be the best way to like take some tentative steps into this arena. That makes sense. And I think the whole... COVID experiences, we might want to call it, you know, there's a lot of trauma in that, you know, everything we all went through separately, but together, like, um, I've worked from home since 2005. So it's no big deal that I was working from home. Same old, same old, as you could say, uh, my husband's a real estate broker. So th for a little while it was like weird, but he does a lot of property management and so there was a lot of new stuff going on with the moratoriums and you can't kick people out and, you know, learning Zoom, which I've been using since 2018. And, um, you know, all of our rotary meetings went online and my support group meetings went online. And there was just things like I was like, I'm not going to be one of these people that complains that my hair is way too long or my nails are a wreck because these are non-problems, even though they were making me crazy. Um, I was so glad I did a video for Instagram one day and my hairdresser saw it. She's like, if you've been sheltering in place, I'll come to your house and cut your hair. And I'm like, please now come today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, I think holding, trying to hold myself to, you know, it's like we didn't lose any jobs. We had downsized to a house that we could afford without, you know, with what the, all the disruption was going on. I mean, the worst thing in the world was, you know, we did not have the toilet paper that I liked and it was hard to find pasta and rice. You know, these are not gigantic problems, but I also lost my mom at the beginning of the pandemic. And then we lost one of our dogs in November of 2020. And then I lost my grandmother. So it was just like, and I gave up photography because of a lot of reasons. Thank you, Steve Jobs, since you brought him up earlier mm -hmm. for making iPhones. So very great at taking portraits. People still needed me, but they didn't know that. So I just finally decided, you know what? We've downsized. We've right-sized our, our life to our income better. And these are all good things. So I kept trying to focus on all the positive, And I'm not sure that that was always the right move. Mm -hmm. I think I should have accepted that there was just some times that things really stunk. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's it. That's the healthy part where we step away from 
having to tell ourselves the silver linings all the time and to realize that, um, you know, this is a world of 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. And a way of walking through life mindfully is to flow between the two um, and to really not just push away the things that seem dark, but to really kind of marinate in them a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that those Zen teachers did when we were taking classes is every time we showed up for a class, they would go around the room and they'd say, I want to hear two emotions that you have right now. And you might say, well, I'm elated because my son came home from college. Um, but I'm also really nervous about um, a project that I have going on or something. So you would see that people hold at least two conflicting emotions, like almost at all times, and that we really do balance these beautifully sometimes. And that's the goal to, to sort of do the dance between the joys and the sorrows. That makes sense. I think that must be harder and you could probably speak to this better than I can for those of us that are caring for a loved one, because it's so hard and it's so, you know, you're confronted every day, almost every minute of the day with what's coming. Yes. There's moments of joy. You know, they always say, find the laughter, which what, you know, isn't as hard as non caregivers might believe. I always took my mom out to watch children, which, you know, I always joked that we were going to go, we're going to go stock on little kids now. And people would be like, if they did not know what I meant, they'd look at me like, do I need to call the police? You know, Because that sounded bad. <laughs> but that's what gave her joy. And she was out in the nature and the sunshine and, you know, just watching kids. That gave her joy. I mean, it, it wasn't easy to get her from the car to the bench. And there were times when it was just frustrating. But once we were sitting there, it was so nice. You know, and then, of course, it was yes. a struggle to get back. But for the most part, uh, well, the way I approached my mom's last three years was I was going to do everything to give her as much joy and quality of life as possible without prolonging her dying from Alzheimer's because I was deathly afraid of the time when she would be bedridden and spoon fed and just, you know, a tiny fraction of the person that she'd been, which she aborted that plan because she broke her leg and died two and a half weeks later, which I'm yeah. also very grateful for. It wasn't easy. I would have thought it would have been like, you know, sad, but thankfully, you know, mom avoided that and we're, we're done with Alzheimer's journey. But I was shocked at how hard it was when she died because I really, really thought I was ready. <laughs> yeah. But as a, and I don't know if your dad's still with you, but you know He's what not. it's okay. So you know what that journey is like. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I know what that journey is like. Actually, five people in my family have had Alzheimer's disease. I grew up in a home with two grandmothers who both had Alzheimer's, and my parents were a doctor-nurse duo, oh and they took care of them in the house. 
And then uh, my dad, my aunt, uh, and now my mother-in-law all had oh Alzheimer's disease. So Yikes. they have all died except for my mother-in-law, who is in her 90s and um, going on, I think, 12 years. Oof. Um, you know, my dad actually was a neurosurgeon. I mean, talk about the irony of this. The brain was his area of study. It was sort of his joy and and his love. And he would sort of joke around when we had my grandmother's living and he said, you know, if this ever happens to me, put me out of my misery. You know, he said, I'm going to be a terrible patient. And lo and behold, my dad got Alzheimer's disease and it wasn't like he expected or we expected at all. Um, his endless curiosity kicked into place in the beginning. And he would sit at the kitchen table with articles about Alzheimer's, sometimes upside down, um, <laughs> you know, trying to make sense of what was happening, but not in a kind of stressed out way, but in a like huge sense of awe. Um, hmm. And for my father, he actually also had prostate cancer. And I think, um, you know, he always said I, I would be a terrible patient, you know, with, with anything. I think that the Alzheimer almost put an edge or took the edge off of his prostate cancer. Um, so I don't want to paint it as all rosy, but in his particular case, often it was different than any of us had ever imagined. And it was such a great lesson to me. Um, now, another thing that those monks taught me was the story of the second arrow. You know, in okay. life, it said like the first arrow is the, the terrible things that actually do happen to us. You know, the illnesses, the accidents, the losses, the, you know, the sorrows of all kinds. But the second arrow is the one where we shoot ourselves, where we keep telling stories and we go into the oh no's and what ifs and we, we make it worse. And that's the part that's within our control to some extent. Now, we don't need to be shot by that second arrow. I've been trying really hard to take that on as a life lesson. I believe and I've read that a lot, you know, like probably what do they say? Like 95% of what we worry about never happens, <laughs> which is probably true. But there's times when you're dealing like, I don't know if this is post pandemic stuff, still having, you know, like struggling, getting enough staff for whatever business you have. But I am really, really tired of chasing people down to do a job that I am going to pay you for. Like, mm -hmm. if I have to work this hard to give you my money, that just drives me bananas. And so it's it's like, it's it's not that, that it's the end of the world, but it's like, I'm dealing with something else that I don't want to necessarily verbalize too well. A situation that it's like, if if the worst thing happens, it's not the end of the world, but it's so not fair because this other person is not they're not using logic. It's like, could you please turn on your brain and realize that this is a very simple fix and I've shown you what the problem is. Just fix it. Stop jerking me around. <laughs> it's just like, I'm trying to get past the unfairness of worst case scenario and just keep working in a positive manner but it's really getting very difficult. <laughs> yeah. And you say something really important. This is not an invitation to be a doormat um, <laughs> in one's life, but really to um, come to clear headed solutions about next steps. And maybe that person isn't the right person to have um, in, in your life or whatever it looks like. Um, but um, the, the sort of, thoughts that we have that kind of take us into dark places in our own minds for hours and days yeah. and weeks and months on end are, um, are not sometimes the best places. Now, I'll give you another example. And this happened to me just as I was releasing Heartwood into the world. It was actually its birthday day for the book um, when a lot of authors are you know, out on a tour or they're doing uh, media interviews and it's a very celebratory day. 
But that day, I was actually having surgery for a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Mm. And um, it was rough. And I'm very fortunate that it was caught early, but I didn't know that at the beginning. You know, you're waiting for the pathology to come back. And um, I, I remember taking a walk with a dear friend of mine who has MS. And Mm. I was doing the what ifs and it's not fairs. And, you know, am I going to see my kids graduate from college someday? And are they going to get married? And I'm not going to be there. And my friend stopped me short. And he said, you know, Barbara, it sure sounds like you're writing chapter 24 of your life when you're only on chapter four. And it was like having just that cold bucket of water in the face, <laughs> a real wake up call to what what we do sort of naturally as humans to kind of just follow our monkey mind down the path <laughs> as it takes a banana and swings off this tree. And like, you know, it's all over the place, you know. And the thing about meditation and those contemplative practices is not to stop thinking, but to kind of drop the judgment now that makes sense mm-hmm. and hearing that from a friend who also has a very terrible disease probably added to the chill of that cold bucket of water <laughs> versus somebody that hasn't dealt with a cancer or ms or whatever you know it they would still be correct but hearing that from somebody in a similar thankfully not as Positive as a position as it sounds like it worked out for you, but you know, that was it sounds preachy, right? If if yeah. somebody hasn't been through it, which is why support groups are incredible. Um, you know, support groups when you're a caregiver, support groups when you're um going through grief, you know, or when you're ill, that it really helps to have other people and the wisdom of what they've learned as they've traversed these mountains of life. Very true. I wonder if our, as I've said for a long time, that our puritanical culture of, you know, historical culture of, you know, work, work, work. And if you're not working and producing, you're basically kind of nothing, which is why, you know, moms that are at home raising children and not working outside of the home are not always looked upon as productive as maybe moms who work and take care of the kids and juggle 15 things, which isn't good for your brain. Or, you know, somebody who's decided, um, like I know somebody that, I don't remember what their big career, quote unquote, was, but they pivoted and went back to school to become a fifth grade teacher. And we all know that teachers don't make nearly what they should in this country. And so, his wife is the breadwinner. And it's like, that makes them happy. So why should we ever judge that? So I sometimes think, you know, it's like our hustle, 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 you know, you gotta, gotta make it, gotta, you know, retire at 40 or, you know, whatever. It's like, just back off. Can we just like do what we need to do to enjoy life? Did we not learn from this pandemic thing that we had that life is a little tenuous and you never know when the rug is going to get jerked out from underneath you. (laughs) That's right. And it's so applicable to, um, you know, judging people for how they give care and what are they doing wrong. And um, I I think we're we're quick to find fault. And um, it, it is a beautiful practice to have a compassion practice and to think of how other people might be responding to life situations based on things that have been hard in their own lives. Um, And to recognize, you know, the the truism that hurt people hurt people. Um, To really kind of see that humanity in everyone. It's not easy. (laughs) That's for sure. I want to tell you about a bereavement um, class that I took that was really, truly wonderful. Uh, there were seven sessions, and in one of the sessions, the the guide, the facilitator, had us um, spend some time being free to diss on the person who had died. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, at first everybody looked around and they thought, oh, like, oh no, can we do this? Like, we can't <laughs> talk about the dead this way. 
but it is part of the healing process too. Like human relationships can be complicated. And in the safety and confidentiality of that group that had really gotten to know one another, we were able to state the places where we felt shame or sorrow or anger over the relationship we had with the person who had died. And I've, um, you know, I've, I've been seeing this increasingly in bereavement groups, a very healthy way to be ultra honest about human relationships, including those, you know, we have lost. That makes sense. Cause I have spoken on this show before my dad and I had a really good relationship from basically 2006 to it's over 10 years to 16. We'd worked together before um, he was diabetic and wasn't good at monitoring, well, managing his blood sugar. So there was afternoons when he was <clears throat> not not a nice person. But when I when we weren't together every day, we had a lot more in common. We connected more because my mom couldn't carry on a conversation very well. So he was kind of a buffer. I could spend time with the two of them. And he and I talked. And there was a lot of things that we did you know, that were really enjoyable. And then when, when he was on hospice, his, the toxins from the dying kidneys of which he had three poisoned his brain. So I literally had two parents with no, no memory skills whatsoever. And he went right back to the nasty, toxic, verbally abusive person. And then, and then I found out close to his death that he just assumed my mom would come live with me without ever discussing it with me. So there's times I've been like, very upset with him. And I I admit it, but it's, I almost feel like I could explore that a little bit more because there's just talking about it. Just, it doesn't bring up the nicest feeling. And it's not that I feel guilty. I, I feel like anger and sadness coming up. So I think I probably should explore that a little more. And it's kind of the same thing with my mom, because she would always say things like, this is, this is a momism. You'd hit, be hit you. So I screwed it up. You'd bitch if you were hit with a new ex. Like, really? First off, yes, because that wouldn't be fun. But it's like, I'm not complaining. What is, like, why are you saying that to me? And then as she got further into the Alzheimer's, there were so many days I wanted to say that to her so bad. <laughs> but I knew better. I was like, that'll be just, I might feel a nanosecond of pleasure throwing that in her face and then it's just going to all go downhill really fast. But, oh, that was so hard to just, you know, not to, I mean, she'd flip the script. It's like, she was the one that I could have said all the negative things to. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to say them because there's no point. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's, you know, I, it evokes stories in me of my mom, who was the sweetest person in the world towards the end of her life, would love to tell me and my brothers how much weight we were gaining. <laughs> oh, and we were like, because we're taking care of you all the yeah. time and we're not out like jogging or doing whatever we do. But um, you see how good it feels to just say it and to share it with another human being. And, you know, we don't mean ill for the the parent figures that we're talking about, but we really, there are some pains and sadnesses and it's just, it's so good to say them. It also normalizes um, these hard moments that everyone will encounter in their lives. That's true. It's not that any of us are saints and yet when we die, everybody kind of treats us as if we are sainted. Yeah, <laughs> let's get over that. <laughs> it's it's funny because I've had enough of these similar types of conversations. Um, I think starting next year, 2024, might be 24 or 25. So human composting will be a um, post-life option, I guess. Because I'm not sure you want to call it burial. because You're not being buried or cremated. You're being composted, which sounds really weird. And I recently listened to an episode of Today Explained, the podcast, and there was a gentleman died rather suddenly. His sister opted for human composting and you get a truckload of dirt, which is a little hard to imagine because it's like, I'm not that big a person, but he, this gentleman loved Japanese maple trees, which is one of my favorites. My yard's got like half a dozen of them. Oh, mine too. 
and oak trees because we have like naturally occurring oak trees, but the Japanese maples are not native, but they're beautiful and they're red yeah. leaves. And so he had some of them in pots on his, in his yard. And so they bagged up some of the dirt, so to speak, and people could take some of him and one of his potted um, Japanese maple trees and plant it with some of him, which I know sounds a little creepy. I don't know a better way of putting it. And I'm like, oh, I like that idea. So I immediately texted my daughter. I'm like, you might want to listen to this because she's kind of on the same boat as me. Like, if you think this will be creepy, just listen to this one section that's usually broken into two sections. Just listen to the first section where this gal talks about her brother because it's less technical and more emotional. And, you know, it's just like we've had a lot of end of life conversations, but I feel like that's so far away from me that it's like, okay, well, like I said earlier, like might need to like make some more bucket list items <laughs> to fill yeah. up these next 47 years. It's interesting. Along with the death acceptance movement um, is coming a very strong uh, look at how we deal with the dead, with dead bodies, all the way from when somebody dies in your home. And um, as you know, when a hospice patient dies, it's not an emergency. You know, like you can actually be with the body for a while. And um, it was actually my mom who bathed my grandmother in our home after she died. And I'll never forget my mom cleaning my grandmother's hands and just saying, you know, imagine she took care of nine little babies with these hands. And it was so moving. And it wasn't that she needed to be removed immediately from the premises in a bag. Like we got to be with her, to talk to her, to put flowers around her body. So I think that's a real positive development that people are like lingering with those who have died and doing rituals or singing songs or lighting candles and kind of going back to what's old is new again. Um, and along with that come a lot of um, thoughts on composting and um uh, green burials out in more forested areas where the body has the chance to like provide nutrients to the forest and wildflowers around it. So yes, these are all um, kind of, I think, exciting things that are happening in the world of ritual and loss. Well, I had decided when my first grandparent died, I was 31. So I was really lucky. And at his funeral at the cemetery, my paternal grandmother, the one that passed away at 103 in 2023, that was a long time to live without her spouse, um, patted the casket and said goodbye. And it was lead lined. And then it went into a hole in the ground that is cement lined. And I'm like, I am not religious, but there is no ashes to ashes, dust to dust going on there. I mean, I don't want to get creepy, but it's like, been a long time, but you can only imagine. I bet you he hasn't decomposed to dust. Like, you know, both my parents were cremated. My Actually, my paternal grandmother was cremated, which was a surprise. And so at that point, I was like, I live in a town where the cemetery is like full. And if you have don't have relatives and or pre-purchased lots, you don't get in. And then, of course, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, there are no cemeteries that you can use in San Francisco. So if you live in San Francisco and you die, you get buried in Colma. There are more dead bodies in Colma, California than in San, than there are live ones. So these two thoughts together, I was like, first off, you know, like you in New York, California's um, real estate is not cheap. And, you know, we've got all these people. We're the most populous state in the union. I'm like, we got to do something different. And so not too far back, you there was a thing where like you could be turned into a tree. And that was what my daughter and I had chosen. Uh, my husband wants to be shot into space. I don't know about my son-in-law. I better ask again. Um, I'm not really fond of the end of the space thing, but that's what he wants. That's fine. But this composting thing sounds really interesting. And I know I have a past guest that was supposed to connect me to somebody that, that could talk on that. So I'll have to find somebody that can talk on that. So it's really interesting. Um, 
just listening to the very, very interesting. And I think another option that people are starting to talk about more and more is um, donating your body to medical science, um, to medical schools, to research um, and organ donation. And in many cases, if you do donate your body in this way, they will take care of the expenses of um, your burial and or your cremation. So that's another option for people. Um, so I think the more we talk about it, the the better so that we know each other's wishes and we get to kind of think through things we might not have thought about before in terms of our own death. Well, we can be open to things like, I mean, human composting, I'm sorry, it still sounds a little ick to me. Um, but, you know, when you think about using somebody's remains to f- plant and fertilize beautiful trees or flowers or every all of it, I mean, that's just so beautiful. And I, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I'm into. I am an organ donor. My entire family knows if any, there's any working part left, give it away because obviously I'm not going to use it. You know, I plan on using them up, I've said that before. Um, but interestingly, having taken our dog to the UC Davis Veterinary Hospital, which is a school, um, we are driving away knowing that, unfortunately, this dog is not likely to make his sixth birthday. I asked my husband, I'm like, well, first off, when our first golden retriever passed away in 2007, um, she waited until we were gone. And the neighbors were taking care of her. Thankfully, they were dog people. Um, She was very, very old. She was almost 14, which is extremely old for a golden retriever. And she'd been going downhill. Her heart was giving out. It's typical. She was dying of old age. Well, she waited until we were out of town and she died of old age on the neighbor's watch. And I said, just take her to the vet. I'll deal with it when we get home. They took her to the vet. They had her cremated. They bought the fancy box. So now every pet after that has had to have the fancy box. And since we moved, all these fancy boxes are in a plastic tub in my closet. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I said, no, we're done with the boxes. And I looked at my husband, who's very, very attached to this dog. And I said, "Um, we've had two others out of six, three of our goldens will have passed away from cancer, which is horrible. And so I said, what if after he's gone, we give him back to UC Davis? basically donate the dog's body back to science because golden retrievers are so overbred and have been that this is very, very common. I mean, obviously 50% of my dogs have died from cancer. It's not cool. And I was really surprised that he was okay with that. We need to call them and see if that's an option, (laughs) but yeah, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's horrible that he's not going to get to six. I mean, we had one that was almost 14 and then we had 12, 11, 13 and then the girl dog's eight and a half she doesn't ever go to the vet except for vet in that vaccinations so who knows with her <laughs> she's so healthy mm-hmm. but um you know like what a beautiful thing it's like okay this is really sad golden retrievers are a great breed oh, but i this, love them yeah but this really makes you three th- it's like okay 50 percent is not great odds yeah so like the next one could also be a victim of this so it's like why not make you know, make something good out of this tragedy of, you know, his life being cut short. And maybe they can figure out what's going on because he was at the vet in December. This is February 6th, as we mentioned earlier. And they didn't, they did an ultrasound because they thought he had an obstruction and they didn't see all these tumors. So that's how rapid it's growing. Well, maybe they can figure something out. Yeah. I had intended to donate my mom's brain to science. And unfortunately, this is something I really should work on. It's not that simple. You have to designate a place, and when they the funeral parlor will pull the brain out, then they give it back to you. It's like, no, 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 no. We need to make this way easier. But because she died sort of suddenly and right in the heart of the start of the pandemic, Mm. I forgot. And Mm. I still feel, I don't want to say guilty. It's frustrating because I really think that that's something we need to do. You know, with, like, your family's had an awful lot of Alzheimer's, so... Yeah, you know, it's like we need to figure out why why yes. this is happening to people. We so. sure do, and I fully intend to give my body for organ donation and medical research as well. You now, I just want to leave you with a thought about the circle of life, and it's why I called the book Heartwood. Um, you know, after my parents died, and they died just a, a couple of months apart from one Oof. another. 
I was really bereft. And I walked with my husband in a forest one day. And I learned that inside every tree is a strong, durable pillar. Uh, You know, it's the part that's prized by woodworkers for its strength. And that's called the heartwood. But what people don't realize is that the heartwood is inert. You know, it's completely dead. But the growth Mm -hmm. rings of the tree wouldn't continue to grow around it if it didn't have the support of what we had that came before and has died. And I just think we people are a lot like the trees. You know, your mom, my mom, my dad, your dog someday, they'll all be in our heartwood. You know, they actually stay with us in some very important way. Now, those that we've loved and lost are never truly gone in that sense. That is true. And that is a perfect and beautiful place to stop. So I really appreciate this. I hope you guys all go and get the book and actually finish reading it. I will probably finish reading it later. (laughs) Just was a little too much with the whole dog situation. Yeah, I'll be thinking about you, Jennifer. I just wanted to mention that there's a reader's guide for Heartwood um, because a lot of book groups are picking it up and it's at barbarabecker.com which will be in the show notes, as you guys should all know by now, but I always always like to remind everybody. So thank you very much. I appreciate the warm thoughts for our family and everybody's families that's going through some sort of challenging times, which, as I mentioned earlier, seem to happen a lot more often lately. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.